Hey, good morning. It's the morning show, and I'm your host, Chipper O'Neill. It's very, very chipper here in the studio because I'm hosting a morning show. Yes, the deep, deep, dark thoughts that I have are always pushed down to the back of my brain because I'm hosting a morning show. We're constantly chipper. We don't need to get woken up with coffee or bananas or smoothies or ecstasy. We just... Get in here and get on with it. Fuck this COVID-19. Oh, maybe I shouldn't be saying fuck on the radio, but I don't care. It's my last day. They're firing me for gross incompetence. Here's Madness with Our House. Salmon of knowledge, just a 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 salmon of knowledge podcast. Hey guys, it's actually not a morning show. Uh, it's not uh, whatever whatever that name was. I can't remember. I've I've said it and I can't remember. It's gone out of my head. Um, relax and O'Toole. Relax and O'Toole. That just sounds like a really bad seventies porn star name. An Irish porn star. You wouldn't have Irish porn stars. I mean, there's no market for it. Uh, you know, what would you even call an Irish porn video? Pale and nasty nymphos. The painless being paramount. I don't know. Who knows? What's going on? What's happening? Guys, are things getting back to normal? I, I don't know. It seems like a weird sort of, like a false ending. You know, people talk about false beginnings all the time, false starts, uh, you know, which is something you do when you're primed, you're cocked and locked and ready to run 100 meters in under 10 seconds. And you've been training four years for it and you're just itching to get going. And sometimes the itch gets scratched too early and you set off from the from the starter point and the starting pistol doesn't even go off. It's just about to hit, but you're like a millisecond ahead of it. That's the, my analogy. This is what's happening. I don't know if there's a... Uh, who knows? Like, it's... it's. Uh, I don't uh, know. Uh, who? Uh, that's what I have to say. Oh, I had way too much food last night. Lots and lots of delicious food. I cooked two... Well, I didn't cook them. Um, I, well, I baked a cheesecake. I baked a Malteser cheesecake, which turned into Cajun style. Well, it was slightly creme brulee around the side because uh, what happened was it needed a few extra minutes, but it got more than a few extra minutes. It got a plethora of minutes. It got at least three more minutes than it needed because I got distracted chopping chorizo and I put on a glove because I didn't want chorizo stink all over my hands. And it nearly, I nearly destroyed the cheesecake that I had lovingly slaved over and put loads of Maltesers in. Um, and actually, I should have, I think I should have chopped them up or maybe I should have, uh, you know, blitzed them in a, in a whisker because they were just there, full balls. And then when they get, <laughs> when they get uh, full balls, when they get baked, they go kind of hard and sort of chewy and the malt inside them it kind of collapses and it's not like they're not as light and fluffy I think yeah I definitely should have blitzed them and chewed them I, I was going for effect I wanted I wanted the effect of the cheesecake growing up and around these balls a lot of people use digestive biscuits and digestive biscuits have always seemed to me to be like the kind of the worst kind of biscuit. They're the kind of biscuits you get as emergency rations uh, during a war or something, you know, like during the emergency. You know, everyone's looking for bourbon creams or uh, Kimberly Mikados or even just like a chocolate chip biscuit. But all you can get is digestives. It seems like they're kind of like the, the laminous bread of biscuits. And now that's a reference to uh, Lord of the Rings, the movies, because I have never read the books. And you know what? I probably never will. I tried listening to an audiobook of the Lord of the Rings, but I couldn't get past it. I got past um, Tom Bombadil, which is the thing that people always complain about, like the, the, the hobbits are, you know, on, the, on their journey 
And uh, Gandalf said, you must, you must take this journey and uh, take the ring and dump it in the fire. Um, actual quote from the book. And the hobbits are in the forest and they meet Tom Bombadil and he says, hey, why don't you hang out with my gaff for a couple of weeks and I'll sing a bunch of songs at you. And they do. And, you know, they didn't put that in the movie, obviously. Um, it's kind of become a, a sort of a running joke. In fact, there's a lovely, uh, uh, well, not reference to it, but uh, Tom Bombadil does appear, spoiler alert, does appear in the Dream Gun Film Reads uh Lord of the Rings episode. If you want to check out Dream Gun Film Reads, uh, it's a wonderful podcast that I am very lucky and blessed, hashtag blessed, to be a part of. And we did Lord of the Rings in Vicker Street. We're doing Star Wars next May the 4th, 2021. So, I mean, hopefully all of this sort of, all of this COVID nonsense will be gone. Because that's how people see it now. They don't kind of see it as a as a global pandemic. It's become, it started off as a global pandemic and it started off as something that people should be worried about and people should be wary of and people should be protecting their vulnerable loved ones and citizens. But now it's become an inconvenience. It's still a, a killer virus that has no vaccine. But because it's been around so long and people are so used to social distancing and flattening the curve and all of these terms that everyone knows now. Uh, it's become, you know, uh, it's become something that, that people are annoyed about because they want to get back to normal. And there's this talk of, well, we have to get back to normal at some stage. And, you know, that's the thing. There is no, there is no time limit on it. And we can't, we can't see the end of it. That's why it's frustrating, because when it began, when it began, oh, ha, oh, ha, I was down in Dunmorris in Waterford, and I was getting engaged to Cara, but um, but um, bum, 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 start of the lockdown, ma, ha, ha, watching Leo talking on the box, it seemed like we were living in a movie. It was like the beginning of a movie. It was like uh, the first act of a movie where like something something terrible happens, uh, you know, like aliens invade. And we can call this an alien invasion. Let's call it a microscopic alien invasion because that's what the virus is. It's uh, an enemy, an invisible enemy that can't be reasoned with. It can't be bargained with. Uh, it can't be dismissed as some world leaders have tried to do, um, to their detriment and to the countries that they are supposedly leading detriment. Now, I'm not going to get into uh, politics because uh, it's a shit show. And getting into it is a shit show because, uh, you know, this is what happens on Twitter. Um, You know, I'm on Twitter just tweeting silly things, tweeting the occasional joke, but everything, you know, Twitter is like the worst possible uh, dinner party that you could go to where you have 20 people at this dinner party and everyone's talking about cats and politics and trans rights and uh, the latest celebrity gossip and Kanye West running for president and uh, a funny video they found of someone exercising in the 1980s to, you know, hip hop country dancing. And everyone's talking about all of these things at the same time and showing you pictures. And it's too much. It's just, it's an overload. I think there should be, I think Twitter should basically uh, just be about, you know, funny stuff and cats and, uh, you know, people tweeting, I remember my first beer. What about you? And then a thread happening or what's, you know, what's your worst memory of childhood or what's your most embarrassing thing that happened to you in a, jo- in a job or and they should have like a separate they should have like a Twitter for, for politics and a, and a Twitter for sports and a Twitter for entertainment instead of just one big massive you know because like you want a little bit of that 
you want a little bit of politics, you want a little bit of sport, you want a little bit of entertainment, but you don't want it all at the same time. You know, eating, that's like Stanley Kubrick eating his dessert and, you know, his dinner, you know, at the same time. Because he used to do that. And I found out recently because I like to watch uh, nerdy videos. I like to watch videos about movies and learn things that I never learned before. And I learned this. I knew Stanley Kubrick, famous um, movie director, who I was trying to do an impression of uh, with my brother on the phone the other day. And we ended up doing, uh, like, let's do impressions of famous directors, which is, uh, you know, that like that's a niche thing. Because not a lot of people know what Stanley Kubrick even sounds like. Um if you look, there's some stuff online. There's interviews with him online. Um, there's that famous uh, behind-the-scenes footage that was shot by his daughter when he was making The Shining, where he's giving out to Shelley Duvall for not being scared enough while making The Shining. And he's, you know, he's kind of, well, not goading her, but he's just, he's acting like a disappointed father. It's like if your dad was making a big horror movie with Jack Nicholson and you... And then he's like, I, you know, I don't think you, you, you're not acting scared, Shelley. You're not as scared as you should be, Shelley. No, Shelley, they're not. I don't believe your tears, Shelley. I know they're real tears, but you need to be more terrified. You know, we're going to be doing this 70 to 150 times and you need to be more scared. But, you know, whenever I do an American accent, it always tends to go into the camp area. Because seriously, because that's how, you know, I like that sort of California, lazy California drawl. Um, but, you know, people can't understand that. But Stanley Kubrick, I knew the fact that he used to eat his dessert and his main and his starter. You know, he'd take a lump of ice cream and then he'd take a, a chunk of steak and then he'd take, a, a, you know, a seafood chowder and he just kind of randomly eat it all at the same time and everyone's like oh that's just shows how crazy and eccentric he was he only did that because for years he was trying to make a napoleon movie he was trying to make a, a big sprawling epic about uh napoleon bonaparte and his napoleon uh movie got torn apart and he never made it uh, but in the research, he did tons and tons of research. He read so many books. He'd like researched Napoleon's life to the nth degree. And he found out that Napoleon uh, used to do that. He used to eat his food randomly. Like he used to, oh, I'll just eat my dessert and I'll eat. And he'd pour his his cherry trifle in with his duck a l'orange and mix it all up and eat it like a big food soup. And so Kubrick started doing that. And telling people, you know, this is how Napoleon used to eat his food. And it kind of sounds like it's like a teenager, you know, wearing ripped jeans because David Beckham was wearing them or something. That's a really weird uh, analogy. Do you love animals? Of course you do. Everyone loves animals. And at Dublin Zoo, we've got more animals than you can shake a stick at. But please don't shake sticks at the animals. It will upset them. We've got lions tigers with plenty of elephants and even more flamingos did you know a group of flamingos is called a flamboyance well you do now we've got sea lions and penguins we've even got tapirs what's a tapir you say well come on down to dublin zoo and find out dublin zoo fun for all the family anyway listen guys how's everyone doing you can't answer me it's a question that i'm genuinely asking i hope you're all okay listening to this I have returned to the cinema for the first time in, well, over four months. I can't remember the last movie I saw in the cinema. Was it The Irishman? I mean, that was a long time ago. But cinemas are back open again. There's obviously social distancing going on in the cinemas. If you're a fan of uh, Pick and Mix, which is sort of a free-for-all uh, people are asked to use the, the, the metal scoops, but they don't always do that. Sometimes they use their grubby, grubby, filthy hands. And they're going, I'll have some of them jelly babies and uh, some of them jelly tots. And I'll have, I just like all the things, uh, je jelly chocolates. I like all the things with jelly in them. Oh, oh jelly bonbons. 
Um, so the, there was no pick and mix. Now I'm not like I'm not a big fan of popcorn. Um, Leo Varadkar, uh, when he was making that speech, that first speech, he's quoted a lot of movies. He quoted Terminator Two, Judgment Day, where he said, "There's no fate except what we make for ourselves." He slightly misquoted it, but he also quoted Lord of the Rings uh, at one stage where he said uh, Samwise's speech at the end of The Two Towers where he's, uh, you know, those people had lots of opportunities to give up, but they kept going because there's good in this world and it's worth fighting for. And when the sun shines, it'll shine out all the clearer. And Leo quoted that. He said, you know, uh, dark days ahead, but the sun will shine out, and when it does, it'll shine out all the clearer. And everyone's like, "Ooh, ding, 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 ding!" Lord of the Rings. And I thought, okay, yeah, I mean that kind of makes sense. And then he quoted Mean Girls. I don't know if he meant to quote Mean Girls, but he quoted Mean Girls in, in another speech. But Lord of the Rings, because the cinemas now have got uh, the Lighthouse Cinema in Dublin is, has got like Cinema Paradiso, and then the Omniplex has uh, The Lord of the Rings. And because I'd seen them so many times, I was like, nah, screw that. So we went to see, myself, my friend Kevin, we went to see The Empire Strikes Back. Because, look, it's one of my favorite movies. Uh, I've seen it a lot, a lot of times. Uh, just like Scylla Black, I'm a huge, huge fan. But I hadn't seen it in the cinema since it was re-released in 1997. But the thing is, I have seen it so many times now that I've kind of ruined it for myself. Not that I've ruined it, but I remember, you know, growing up watching it a lot. And then when it was re-released, uh, the special editions where they put extra special effects in. But the, the nice thing about the special effects is, you know, like the original movie uh, or, you know, episode four, A New Hope, had like a whole awful Jabba the Hutt CGI bit in it which made no sense at all. It was horrific. It looked terrible. And they had like loads of extra stuff on it, which kind of dragged the movie down because it's just such a well-cut movie. And then they just fucked it up by putting all these extra bits in that they didn't need to. Uh, Empire Strikes Back had no extra scenes. It was just like a sort of a digital polish, merely aesthetic stuff. The snow monster at the beginning, they uh, changed that to make it just a bit more scary looking um, because it's too much like it's still a guy in a suit but it's just a better suit and it looks kind of scarier I mean when I was a kid I was kind of scared of it anyway but uh, so that yeah the pacing of it is exactly the same and when I saw it re-released in 1997 I, we watched all three of them over the course of three weekends and I came out of that one and the first one, actually, but not really Return of the Jedi. I came out of Empire Strikes Back, like, all jazzed up. And like, wow, woo, baby, what a movie. And it was um, because I've seen it projected. Like, it's it's when you watch it on, on TV, on an old tube TV in the, the mid-90s, although we probably had a kind of, we probably had a flat screen tube TV, which was like the last iterations of tube TVs before you're kind of, before the HD revolution came and the, the doors were kicked down by HD TVs who came in and they dragged the tube TVs uh, out into the street and beat them to death with the remote controls that controlled them. And we as a family stood back helpless. And when the dust settled and the HD flat screen TVs came in and position themselves in the sitting room where we were terrified and we just had to watch them just to appease them and we never turned that TV off but um, yeah it was a huge leap from watching it on a small TV to watching it in the cinema projected whereas now I have seen The Empire Strikes Back on massive HD TVs with surround sound which is something I never would have had as a kid and it's almost just as good as going to the cinema. So when I went to see The Empire Strikes Back the other night, unfortunately for me, because I've seen it so many times, I just noticed, because it was on the big screen, 
and I was sort of looking around at other stuff. But I did notice the um, kind of mistakes or the, the things that didn't make sense. The movie logic that, you know, a lot of the time you can dismiss that because it's a movie. And especially when it's a movie in space and it's a fantasy movie, you can kind of disregard stuff. But there were things that I noticed, and some of them are minor, and some of them are, you know, kind of nitpicky. But that's kind of all I was saying, because, you, you know, you don't... The stuff that's amazing and really works uh, still amazes me. Like, like the number one thing that's amazing about The Empire Strikes Back is Yoda, is the fact that a puppet uh, slash a Muppet, controlled by Frank Oz uh, and voiced by Frank Oz, performed by Frank Oz. I'm I'm sorry, Mr. Oz. Uh, of course, it's not just controlled. You're you're putting in a performance, and and what a performance, because the whole movie, like the the sequel to like the biggest box office success, all hinged on a little rubber puppet, which is insane when you think about it. Because he's like, he's a big part of the movie. He's to me, he's like. The best thing about the movie, apart from the duel at the end with with, with uh, Vader and Luke, where Vader is uh, kind of taunting Luke, you know, he could kill him in a second, but he's trying to turn him to the dark side. So he, you know, like he has that scene with the Emperor, and the Emperor in the special edition is played by Ian McDiarmid, who played the Emperor in Return of the Jedi, but uh, when they made Empire Strikes Back, he hadn't been cast yet. No one had been cast as the Emperor. So they did this weird thing where they used a bit of a chimpanzee and a bit of a woman. And they melded them together. And then some other person did the voice. But it's one of those things that they changed it. And aesthetically, it works. And he looks fantastic, the Emperor. And of course, he's got that wonderful voice. So it made sense that they would do that. I kind of... Like, Empire Strikes Back is the only one of the movies that I kind of agree with all of the changes that they made. The only extra stuff that they shot for Empire Strikes Back was CGI shots of the Falcon landing in Cloud City, like flying in and landing. But Yoda, yeah, Yoda is incredible, an incredible performance by Frank Oz. And I kind of, I I was looking at it going, why does Yoda work so well? And I think one of the reasons is because Luke Skywalker, a.k.a. Mark Hamill, is a human man and everything else around him on Dagobah is not. You know, it's a set. It's not a real planet. Spoiler alert, just in case you didn't know. It's a big, massive set. Uh, There's uh, R2-D2, who's a robot. There's weird... uh, uh, stop motion kind of bat creatures space bats um and i noticed in in a lot of scenes like when he's going into the the cave that is like strong with the dark side which kind of doesn't make any sense like why is yoda living on dagobah and why on dagobah where there's this old jedi master is there like an evil sith dark side cave where you confront your fears why like he he built that that's part of the training because he says it, like, powerful in the dark side is that cave. And Luke never kind of goes, why is this cave here, Yoda? Um, but yeah, Luke is the alien, and everything else makes sense. Like, it's Yoda's uh, place, it's his gaff, it's his uh, planet where he's where he's in exile. So, like, Luke is the, the odd thing out. So everything else makes sense, but Luke doesn't. That's what I was thinking. I wasn't high or... Uh, drunk or anything I was just like oh okay yeah and then I noticed a thing which I'd never seen before but maybe it's always been there on his top lip on one side of his top lip the kind of far side of his top lip he's got this like little tuft of hair and I'd never ever noticed it before and I was looking at it and this is the special edition so they would have you know cleaned up stuff and maybe gotten rid of stuff but I was like oh yeah he's got like a little it's like he shaved his mustache, but he forgot like one little bit. And then he went out for the evening and was like, oh, no, I've got this little tuft of hair. It's like when I shave my head, but I can't see the back of my head. So suddenly there's like a little square Hitler sized mustache piece 
on the back of my head that I forgot to shave and it's embarrassing. So I noticed that. What else did I notice? Yeah, at the start of the movie, when Luke is attacked by the snow monster, the abominable space snow monster, and the snow monster drags Luke unconscious, he chokes his tauntaun. He chokes the tauntaun, and the tauntaun goes, I'm dead. And then he drags Luke back to his cave to eat him. But he doesn't drag the tauntaun back, because, like, the tauntaun is a much bigger animal. So instead of dragging a big, fat a tauntaun back to eat, he drags a small, pink human man. And, like, in fairness to Luke, he's very lean uh, in the movie. He's got wonderful uh, definition in his arms. But that's like a starter. That's like a, a chicken wing compared to a lasagna, which is what the tauntaun would be. And some people might say, well, you know, the t- tauntaun's too big. But he's a massive snow monster. And one of the first shots of his uh, snow cave, when we return uh, and see Luke hanging upside down with his feet frozen in clear, solid ice in the ceiling, which, again, how did he do that? How did the snow monster do that? Why didn't he just kill Luke and just leave him there? Because, you know, he's living in a freezer. It's not like he's going to go off. You know, he'll be preserved. And the opening shot of the cave is a big skeleton of something that's, you know, as big or possibly bigger than a tauntaun. Like, uh, look, I know the reason why is because it's a movie and it had to happen. And I guess it's like we want to give off the impression that, you know, Luke is hanging upside down like meat in a meat locker. Uh, I mean, like, why didn't he just tie him up with snow rope or put some ice handcuffs on him? And, uh, you know, do it that way. But I realized at the end of The Empire Strikes Back, at the end of the experience, when the credits rolled, you know, I think I'll give it a good long while before I watch any Star Wars movie, because I know it too well. And my friend Kevin suggested that we maybe go see Lord of the Rings. And I was like, ah, I've seen them too many times. But I do get it. I understand why they're showing Star Wars and they're showing Lord of the Rings and in the kind of more art housey cinemas, they're showing, you know, Cinema Paradiso, which is an art house movie, but also a crowd pleaser. Got some wonderful Ennio Morricone music, uh, because he passed away recently. Um, and it's a beautiful movie, and it's about uh, movies, and it's about the love of movies. I'd recommend going to see that. In fact, I probably would go see that, because I've only seen it once, and I can barely remember it. But I wouldn't go see Lord of the Rings, because I've seen it too much. But I think it's there in the Omniplex cinemas, because Leo Varadkar mentioned it in one of his uh, addresses to the nation. He quoted Lord of the Rings. And there is this thing of, especially with Return of the King, false endings, where you think it's over, but then it keeps going. And there's like three or four people complain too many endings with uh, the Lord of the Rings. But in a way, there's been so many characters and so much shit has happened. You want to see, you want to wrap it up Completely. You want to see what happens to the hobbits and Gandalf and uh, Aragon becomes the king and Liv Tyler comes in and the music is, I don't want to close my eyes. I don't want to fall asleep. I just want to throw the ring into the fires of Mount Doom. Um, and it's all happy and have that wonderful moment. You bow to no one and everyone, everyone bows to the hobbits. And and eventually it ends, because that's what it feels like now. It feels like at the beginning of this whole thing, where Leo was on the TV talking about uh, lockdown and what was going to happen, and it genuinely felt like that moment in the first act of a movie where the president comes on and says, aliens have invaded or, you know, whatever. We've all been encased in jello or or whatever crisis was happening. And there, but there will be an end to this, and we we're ever, oh, here we go, we're stealing ourselves for the beginning of this thing. Whereas now, it's like, we don't know when this movie is going to end. Uh, it's all up in the air like a bunch of balloons, and it kind of feels like we're in the third act of Return of the King, and we think that this is the last scene, but it's not. And we have to get to the point where Samwise, you know, walks into his gaff, 
and his kids come out and he and he's like I guess I'm home and then it fades to black on the hobbit door so guys that's enough shiting on about uh, Empire Strikes Back and kind of Lord of the Rings and a little bit of Covet and whatever else I was talking about in between thanks so much for listening and we are going to conclude now with the latest episode of Love Notes which is kind of like a sort of a season finale in which uh, certain things are wrapped up and it leaves it wide open for literally anything to happen in the next episode. And I think next week's episode is going to go a little bit crazy and a little bit possibly cosmic. So uh, look out for that next week. But for now, enjoy what I'm calling the sort of season finale of Love Notes. And I'll see you guys soon. Uh, bye 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 bye. Take care. Previously on Love Notes. <laughs> So, Johnny, if you'd like to lie down on the altar here, and then we'll begin the human sacrifice. Um, when you say uh, human sacrifice, Kara, do you mean uh, you're going to kill me? Yes, you're going to be killed. Oh, right. Does that mean that you're going to put uh, a kilt on me, like with a sparring? Do I have to take off my underpants? Because I believe that the Scottish don't wear underpants when they're wearing a kilt. No, you fool. You're going to be killed. K-I-L-L-E-D-T. Kill it. You're going to kill me. What? We now return to Love Notes. In progress. Jesus, Johnny, what have you done? Why didn't you stay in love notes when I told you to stay there and run the place before I got back and you wouldn't be in this fucking mess? Look, all I care about is that Ghost Notes, the club that I want to run with the spirit of all jazz people, get going. And if that means that Johnny has to die, then so be it. Because as the old saying goes, you can't make an omelette without breaking a few eggs. Are you calling me an egg? No, I'm calling you an omelette. Oh, all right, that's not too bad. What are you talking about? Johnny, you're going to be a dead omelette. Oh, Jesus, this is terrible. Oh, God, I thought Pa was in love with me. And now I don't know who I'm in love with. Tina, will you bloody forget about your love life for one minute? This is serious. This is life and death and ghosts and jazz. I know. I'm so scared. That's all I can think about. I'm trying to think about happy things. Like the last time I was in love. When was that? When was the last time you were in love? Oh, I don't know, Paul. Why don't you tell me? Or maybe you'd like to tell Judita. But you're Judita. Yeah, I know. Listen, all of you, shut up. Johnny, get on the altar. All right, I suppose uh, I'll have to do what she says. She who must be obeyed, huh? <laughs> Listen, just because you're in a relationship doesn't mean you have to do every little thing that she tells you to do. But I thought that's how relationships went. That's how toxic relationships go. And you're definitely in a toxic relationship. Uh, what do you mean, Tony? Well, you're in a relationship with the witch, and she's going to sacrifice you in order to bring back the ghost of Miles Davis so he can play music in her new club that she set up with Paul, who used to run Love Notes, with me, Tony, but now I'm running it by myself. You're going to be killed, that's what I'm saying. Ah, you know, anything for a quiet life. But your life will be over. I'm sorry, what does everyone think about this? Tina, listen, Johnny, I don't care about any of this. All I want to know is, Paul, Cara, can I come play trombone in your new club Ghost notes. What are you talking about, Tina? I'll tell you what I'm talking about, Tony. I'm talking about being underappreciated as a jazz trombonist for too long. Well, well, well. Looks like Tony has turned another woman against him. And that woman is you, Tina. The woman. Yeah, but you're a woman too. I'm a witch. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot about that. Listen, Tony, Tina, Kara, Johnny. Yeah? yeah? Yes? I know this whole thing is uh, crazy and out there, and some people don't even believe in ghosts. I know you, Tony, especially didn't think that this place was haunted. And it's not. But hopefully, it soon will be. Yeah, I really got ahead of myself there, didn't I, Paul? I thought that this fun fair was haunted. But what I didn't know was that it was pre-haunted. Well, I suppose I better play my part. That's right, Johnny. 
You're so enamoured with me, you'll do anything I say, including lying on this sacrificial altar. There's a cushion there. Oh, yeah, a nice cushion. Ah, this is nice. A nice little lie down. I've been working so hard in love notes. What do you mean you've been working so hard in love notes? Well, Tony, you've been gone. You've been up here pretending to be Italian and hiding out and listening in and finding out all the things. Listen, Johnny, I don't think you should do this. Tony, I think you should let Johnny do whatever he wants. Stay out of this, Paul. You stay out of this. This is my fun fair. This is my sacrificial altar. I paid for it. I've bankrolled this whole kitten caboodle. I don't care if you've bankrolled the mewing. What the hell are you talking about, Tony? Listen, I'm listening. I'm warning you. If you start this club, you'll unleash a bloody war. A jazz war. And the only people that lose in a jazz war are the participants in that particular war. Shut up, Tony. I don't care about you anymore. Remember, I told you I left Love Notes. I said it in the last episode, but no one really reacted to it, so I'm going to reiterate it now. I'm leaving Love Notes. And I want to play trombone in Ghost Notes. Tony, you're like the opposite of catnip to women. You're like anti-catnip. Cara, you've truly lost your mind. Yes, Tina, you can play trombone in the new club. Well, well, hang on a second there. Uh, You haven't cleared this with me, Cara. Paul, seriously, you're going to say that you're somehow in control here? I'm the witch. I'm the one with the powers. I'm the one who's going to sacrifice people and bring back the ghost of Miles Davis. I'm doing all this. What the fuck are you doing? I'm bankrolling the whole thing. Money. (laughs) Tina, I'd love to have you on board. Oh, that's great. There's only one thing, Tina. You're going to have to be a ghost. What? What? I said, you're going to have to be a ghost, which means you're going to have to be sacrificed as well. Uh, Listen, I'm getting a bit cold here. I mean, my head's warm. But the rest of the sacrificial table is quite cold. Can you, you know, move it down with the sacrifice? All right, all right, all right. I can't believe this is happening. Look, everyone relax, or I'm going to take me gun out again. Killing everyone here is not going to solve anything. The only thing that's going to solve anything is me specifically killing Johnny on this altar. Yeah, we all know what's going to happen. All I'm going to say is, don't. Well, you make a strong argument, Tony. Tony, you stay out of this. I don't have to listen to you anymore. God, I'm so sick of your shit. Talking shit. Leaving big smelly shits in the toilets and love notes. God, you're so full of shit, Tony. You should eat less. Listen, how many times I shit a day is my business. All right. And look, I don't want to be done for murder. But you don't want to be done for murder either, do you, Cara? Listen, Tony, it's not murder. Johnny is doing exactly what I want him to do. He's consenting to this death. A consensual death is still a death and it's still a murder. Listen, Tony, just relax, okay? Just back up. Right, that's enough. All right, all right, Tony, just relax. Nobody's going to get hurt. Yeah, Tony, relax, will you? Cara, maybe you should be a little bit more concerned. He's got a gun. I don't care about his gun. Well, you should be worried, Cara. Because I'm aiming this gun right at your hand. You drop that sacrificial knife right now. You want me to drop this knife? Yeah, I do. I want you to drop the knife. All right, okay. You, th- this knife here in my hand? You, this yeah, knife. The one in your, you want yeah, me to drop the this? one in your hand. Stop playing around. Okay, uh, let me just put it down here. In Johnny's heart. Oh, me heart. Jesus, Johnny. Johnny? Johnny? Yes. Johnny is sacrificed. Yes, Johnny. You are the sacrifice that will bring about the ghost of Miles Davis. The sacrifice of love, because you love me. Um, uh, what are you talking about? I I don't really love you. I only said that I loved you, so you'd kiss me in that place. What the fuck are you talking about? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm not in love with you. Well, 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 the tables have turned. Johnny's not in love with you, so that means Miles Davis is not coming back. Cara, I've bankrolled a lot of money into this thing. Jeez, I'm, I'm sorry, Paul. I, I, I just, I thought that Johnny loved me. I thought you had to be absolutely sure. Jesus, does this mean that uh, I'm not going to be able to play trombone in ghost notes? Nicely done, Johnny. Oh, wait, you're dead. You can't hear me. Tina, you've shown your true colours. Cara, 
Better luck next time. And Paul, you better be on the first train out of town. Yeah, I guess I'll get a train out of town and never come back. I'll have to go back to the coven. In shame. Well, things wrapped up very nicely. Tina, what about you come back to Love Notes with me? And serve drinks? I don't think so, Tony. No, I want you to play notes. You what? Yeah, I want you to play the trombone again. I'm sorry, Tina. I'm sorry I made you wait tables. It's just, you're tromboning. It's so good. I couldn't take it. What are you talking about, Tony? Every time I see you play the trombone, I just... I can't help my feelings. What the hell are you talking about there, Tony? Sure up, Paul. I'm trying to tell Tina about my feelings. What, are you ta- what feelings? What are you talking about? Tingly feelings? Something wrong? With your circulation? Or is it... No, Tina, no. It's it's emotional feelings that I'm feeling. Tony, what the hell are you talking about? Oh, you've got emotional feelings. Sure up, Paul. Oh, Jesus, I can't believe you're going to say it. Yes, Tina. I love notes you. You what? What? Oh, Tony, once again, you can't resist a brunette, can you? Sure up, you. Oh, Tony. Tina. Tony. Tina. Paul. I'm sorry, uh, I'm sorry things didn't work out between us. Yeah, me too. But sure, maybe you'll find some nice Italian bird. Yeah, maybe I will. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh, I get it. <laughs> An Italian bird. <laughs> oh, it's funny. What will happen next on Love Notes? Will Tony and Tina have a fulfilling and long lasting relationship? Will Tina's tromboning revive Love Notes? Will Paul get on that train and get out of town? What will happen to Kara back at the coven? Is this the end of Love Notes? Or will something completely unexpected happen next week which will take it in a completely different direction? Find out and next week on The Love Notes. Wow, guys, what an amazing uh, semi-ending. You know, a lot of things are wrapped up there. Uh, shame about Johnny dying. Uh, I don't know if, if anyone's going to be charged with murder for that. Uh, but um, I guess we'll we'll find out next week when uh, some more random shit happens. If you If you're listening to this, then you've reached the end. And uh, thank you so much for reaching the end. And I hope and pray that you'll be okay. And I'll talk to you another day. So take care of yourselves. And uh, if you can, find it in your hearts and your fingers uh, when you're you know, sitting on the toilet or waiting in a waiting room or you have five minutes to spare, instead of looking on BuzzFeed or finding out what Kylie Jenner and the latest celebrities are wearing on their feet and hands, then give my podcast a review. Uh, Give it five stars, because I think it's worth it. Here's the review. Ed's class. Great having him in my ears. Keep up the good work. Five stars.